I don't know if he is. Colonel Kurt, welcome and thank you again. Thank you, Hugh Hewitt. This is Kurt Schlicker. I am not allowed in New York or any other commie state, well, except California, my home. And I am here in the Relief Factor studio in sunny Southern California at oh, dark 30. Who the heck am I, you ask? That is a great question. Let me tell you. I'm the senior columnist at townhall.com, where I write a column every Monday, Wednesday, and Thursday. I am a retired United States Army infantry colonel. It's important. I am not a JAG. I am not a judge advocate. You might think so because I'm also a noted California trial lawyer here in Los Angeles. And I am the author of the new book, and you can you can see it. No, you can't see it behind me. I don't even know the right. There it is. We'll be back. The Fall and Rise of America. If you're watching uh, on the universe, and you should be, you can you can see my uh, my visage behind me on the cover of the new book. We'll be back. The Fall and Rise of America. I'm kind of pointing at you. I'm calling you out. I'm saying, hey, it's time to get excited. Time to get motivated. We got a lot of challenges ahead, folks. But I think, and I'm going to kind of. Use an analogy from those home improvement shows. I think America has good bones. I think we're going to come through it. But there's a lot of challenges ahead. Are we going to find ourselves in a national divorce? Are the uh, lonely, liberal, wine women just going to kind of barren us into oblivion? Are we going to have some sort of civil conflict? I talk about all that stuff. I leverage my legal knowledge and my military skills. It's a great book, according to me. Oh, I got all sorts of blurbs on it, so you should go check it out. We'll be back, The Fall and Rise of America. Let's get to the news, and the news is, well, let me start out with something sad and infuriating. In Texas uh, yesterday, they discovered yet another truck packed to the rafters with dead illegal aliens. 42, 42 human beings dead, locked in a truck killed by the heat, because Joe Biden and the Democrats refuse to enforce America's laws. I keep hearing all this garbage about my democracy. And of course, we're having another, did you know there's another J6 meeting today? Apparently some great new evidence came out about how some guy dressed like Conan with horns on his hat was going was gonna to have a coup. Idiocy. Idiocy. You know, go get Sean Eastman. Get his phone. He's the criminal. Uh, Idiots. We keep hearing about our democracy. Well, I don't know. You know, I I was a graduate of California public schools, which means I learned about civics from that I'm just a bill thing. Schoolhouse rock on Saturday mornings in the 70s. The immigration laws were passed by the House of Representatives. They were passed by the Senate. They were signed by the president. They are laws. The Constitution requires that our alleged president enforce those laws. He's refusing to do that. So what do you call it when a democratically elected law is simply ignored? By the chief executive. Do you call it democracy? You want a threat to the democracy? Is it is a threat to democracy a bunch of elderly Trump voters wandering through the rotunda taking selfies or a president who refuses to take care to enforce the laws? I think I know the answer. And I think I have I think we have 42 more reasons why this is an abomination. They are killing people, folks, not only not only by drawing immigrants into a very dangerous transit, forcing them to interact with international cartels. That's before we even start talking about the fentanyl that killed over 100,000 Americans last year. Oh, but they don't care. Nah, they don't, they don't care. And we're the bad guys, folks. I just want to I want to make sure you, you understand, because we don't want people broiled alive in trucks because we don't want Americans ODing on Chinese made fentanyl sold by Mexican drug cartels because our border is wide open. We're the bad guys. It's infuriating. But we're coming around. 
we're winning. We're on a winning streak. Thursday, New York State Rifle Pistol Association. Judge Clarence Thomas, my favorite justice, reaffirmed the Second Amendment. He was unequivocal. Friday, Justice Samuel Alito, runner-up for fav favorite justice. We are overturning and overruling Roe v. Wade and Casey. Sending the question of abortion back where it belongs to the states. Well, Kurt, I don't understand. If why, why, why can't the states regulate guns, but they can regulate abortion? Well, I'm glad you asked. And we will have some great people here to, to talk about that in more detail. Carrie Severino will be up later. Ilya Shapiro will be up. But let me just tell you why. Because you got a right to keep and bear arms. I know, because it's in the Constitution. You don't have a right to an abortion. I know, because it's not in the Constitution. Nor has it been a recognized right since the time the Constitution was enacted. It's easy. One's a right. And therefore, states can't decide, Now nah, we don't want to have that right. We've got a balancing test. You know, it's a right, but we got a really good reason for not letting you have that right. No, nope, that's not how rights work. An abortion, not a right, which means the legislatures can regulate it. Generally, as they see fit, it's a reasonability test. In many states, this infanticide, this bizarre sacrifice to Moloch that's become a sacrament of the Democrat Party, well, that's going to be banned. And here in California, I think it's mandatory. I think you're required to do it. And I think you're uh, allowed to do it pretty much up to the time you uh, can apply for Social Security. Yesterday, the streak continued. The Kennedy case. We had a guy who's a coach, right? Football coach. And he's a Christian. But he might have been Jewish. Or he might have been Muslim. He might have been Zoroastrian. He would go, kneel down, and say a prayer. Around football games. Right? You're allowed to do that in America. You have a right to exercise freely your religion. You have a right to speak freely. His school district fired him. And it was interesting why they fired him. They said, well, we're, 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 we'd be exposed to litigation because, uh, because this is establishing religion. Okay, not establishing a religion. A guy sitting there praying doesn't establish religion. Yeah, I know he's on the clock. Okay. And 6-3, uh, written by Gorsuch, Justice Roberts joined in. And... Uh, you know, the bottom line, you're 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 allowed to be religious in America. You're allowed to pray, even if you have a federal job, even if bureaucrats don't like it, even if bureaucrats don't understand the law and are afraid of getting sued by other people who don't understand the law. You know, the First Amendment's not hard, folks. You can speak freely. You can protest peacefully. You can exercise your religion as you see fit. And the government will not create a church. Simple. It's not hard. But there's so much, oh my gosh, the anti-Christian bigotry. It's really disgusting. You know, I don't, I don't understand a lot of what the left does. They are unbelievably racist. Look at the reaction to Clarence Thomas. And it's weird because Clarence Thomas wrote the gun case. He didn't write Dobbs, the abortion case. Yet they still decide to go at Clarence Thomas. Gee, how's Clarence Thomas different from the other judges? Well, the essence of the liberal project is racial distinctions. It just is. I mean, you know, I, I haven't seen Democrats so upset since the last time the Supreme Court overturned longstanding precedent that required human beings be treated inhumanly. 
which is Brown versus Board of Education. In any case, we got a lot more. I got big news about Kamala Harris. I was going to get in the first segment. I didn't. We got so much on Kamala. Kamala's, well, she's running, folks, for vice president again. I'm Kurt Schlichter, guest hosting for the great Hugh Hewitt, author of the new book, We'll Be Back, The Fall and Rise of America. Stick around. This is Kurt Schlichter, guest hosting for the great Hugh Hewitt. You know, I was a United States Army colonel. Unlike my next guest, I was not Special Forces. I was the opposite of Special Forces. My next guest, Jim Hansen of America Matters. Follow him at Jim Hansen with an O, D.C. on Twitter. He was the scalpel. Now, of course, I was the sledgehammer because I had an artillery battalion. Jim, how are you doing? <laughs> Good to be with you, buddy. Hey, it's great to be with you. Look, you are uh, uh, an expert on many things. But mo but one of the things you are the expert on is information operations. I would like to review with you, an expert, uh, the Democrat information operation that seems to be going on right now. Because, frankly, I am confused because they seem to have missed some of the basics of information operations. Uh, exhibit A. Building confidence in leadership, we get someone like Kamala Harris, our vice president, saying something like this. Cut number six. I think that there can be no higher priority than what we have been clear is our highest priority, which is bringing down the cost and the prices as much as we possibly can. And we will stay focused on that. Uh, Jim. Is that a confidence builder to you in, uh, in, in the leadership that's present in the White House? Because now uh, Kamala says she's uh, she's going to be the vice president, presidential candidate again because uh, President uh, Grandpa Badfinger's running again. What do you think? You know, Kamala Harris is a joke. I mean, it, it's funny. <laughs> at least at least she is is honestly, you know, a good representative of Democrat identity politics because they don't pick based on merit they pick based on characteristics that they decide you know are important so she wasn't picked for for being a quality politician or smart or anything else she was picked because she's a uterus carrying melanin having uh i, I guess technically now she might be a woman or she's a womanish character no, no 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 she made very clear to dana bash that she is not only a woman but she is the daughter of women and the granddaughter of women and there you go. There's another I mean, brilliant example of clarifying something like that their highest priority is their highest priority and that a woman is the granddaughter and daughter of a woman. You know, those are the kind of, of cogent <laughs> observations that we need from leaders in this country. So I think, honestly, she could not be a better standard bearer for the Democrats. I, I, you know, I just don't understand why the Democrats or even Joe Biden would want to keep someone like her around. I mean, she's she is an albatross. She is a millstone around her neck or his neck, his saggy, you know, turkey <laughs> uh, thing neck. His jowl. Jowly. Yeah. <sighs> but, now, but the thing is, how do you get rid of her? You know, once you do that, if you if you throw her overboard, then he'll be attacked by his own mob. You know, they will they will say you're you're throwing a black woman who who earned this on her own merit, not because, you know, she was a sex partner of Willie Brown, the kingmaker out there in California. You know, they're they're gonna use all that against you. So I, I think they're stuck with her, you know, and I, I don't know what they're gonna do. They're they're again, they're like the dog that caught the car. What are you going to do now that you've got it? And the answer is fail, I think, in 2024. Well, look, I, I think they have a real messaging problem. Uh, and they point it out themselves. They're, 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 their, thing, their, their notion, though, is the, the, the messaging problem is the only problem. It's not the substance behind it. Uh, but they're not, they're not even able to cover up their, their failures with good propaganda. And I just I, I find it baffling that they are so completely tone deaf. You know, she, they, you know, are, are, are people really that concerned that you might have to cross state lines to kill your baby when their real problem is seven dollar gallon gas? Well, and again, you said it. The, the real problem is their policies are deadly. A life under Democrat rule in any place in America where they've been in charge is hellish. 
And people are now noticing that because things have gotten so bad, you can't avoid it. And I think they're, again, back to the information war, they're picking horrible battles. You know, they pick the yes. battle of we, we prefer the thought police over free speech. You know, we prefer killing babies over life. You know, we prefer telling everyone that they're racist over, you know, treating people on the, the content of their character. And we believe that the most freakish people's sexual preferences should be celebrated. Well, I, I, good. Thank you. You know, let's fight over that stuff. Well, look, look, Jim Hansen, uh, I find it bizarre that the Democrats have uh, the, the left as a whole, it's not just Democrats, uh, has moved away from what I thought was a brilliant information framing for abortion, which is safe, legal and rare, because th with that framing, you actually acknowledge the concerns of your opponents. Uh, the opponents find it distasteful. They don't want to have it. You actually concede something while really conceding nothing. You say, look, I, I want it rare. And people are like, OK, so you can see that it's not a, a favorable thing that reframes it as a problem to be solved. But now it's been taken over by these pierced, uh, blue haired, tatted up uh, freaks who, uh, you know, twerk their abortions, shout their abortions. They're happy. You know, people, I've had four abortions and I feel fulfilled. And normal people, even ones who might be pro-choice, look at that and go, what the hell is wrong with you, you mutation? It's a terrible and information uh, uh, strategy or tactic. For them, it's, yeah, if it's terrible for them. It's wonderful for us because it highlights the difference between the, the two cultures that are yes. now at war in this country. One is personal responsibility paired with liberty. You know, so you have the freedom to do things, but you're responsible for your own actions. The other one is a consequence-free lifestyle where nothing you do can be your fault. Any failure is someone else's you know, has caused it for you, and you should be able to live your life doing whatever makes you feel good with the government there to bail you out. Again, thank you for that framing. We'll have that argument all day long because normal people can see that that doesn't work and that, they're again, their standard bearers aren't, aren't just idiots and, and failures like Kamala Harris. They are the freakish weirdos who they have now decided are the, the emblem of the new left, and, and I, God bless them for it. Well, I hate going back to Bill Clinton, but I, I uh, you know, I, I like to assess my opponents correctly. And I think he was one of the top political talents of the last century. And, you know, the safe, legal and rare framing was an, uh, was probably the best possible framing uh, for an abortion advocate. But, you know, you look at the you look at the uh, you look at what he did with Sister Soldier, where he basically turned around and and took a, a a outsider alienating view and repudiated it to win over the middle. I don't see any Democrat leaders getting up and saying, hey, you know, I don't agree with Dobbs, but we shouldn't be thrilled about abortions and this weird, uh, you know, these weird rituals where people are walking around dressed as handmaids and dolls in front of justices houses. That's not helping anything. That's not that's not what we're about. And and that might win back some of the people who this bizarre behavior is alienating, but they don't seem capable of doing it. Where are the adults? They don't have adults. That's part that, of the consequence that is. of free lifestyle. Is yep. they, they refuse to grow up and they refuse to take personal responsibility. And and I think they've they've gotten so angry. You know, Trump made them pull their pre COVID masks off, you know, that <laughs> they used to hide, like you said, between nice thoughts and, and good marketing for their ideas, which were still based in socialist and totalitarian and authoritarian ideas. And they at least could pretend though you know, that it was more about trying to make everyone safe and, and making people equal and things like that. Now they're like, no, you will do what we say. We will use any uh, part of state power to enforce that. And if you don't like it, screw you. We're going to throw you in jail. And, and I think they give, no longer have the ability to fake it. They were faking it for many decades. That's successfully, true. And, and now they're just they're not faking it anymore. They're like, we hate America. We want to burn it down and build a socialist crap hole in its place. And again, I, I thank them for their honesty. I appreciate it. And we're going to crush them at the polls and remake this country uh, in a better image. Well, uh, Jim Hansen, one of the things about Donald Trump 
is his amazing ability to uh, compel other people to clarify what they really think. And I think he, he made uh, not only the Democrats embrace what they really think, to come out and say what before had uh, not really been said in public, but he also did that for a lot of conservatives, the, uh, the Ahoy crew, the cruise ship conservatives. We now have guys like Charlie Sykes, Bill Crystal, you know, George Will, all the rest, very, very angry. That the, that the Supreme Court has upheld the right to keep and bear arms. Furious that Dobbs overturned Casey and Roe v. Wade. I mean, that's, you know, it's one thing not to like Donald Trump as a candidate because he has a few faults, one or two. But to totally repudiate the actual conservative uh, platform that they were telling us for decades and collecting money to uh, uh, support. I, I find that uh, bizarre. I, I, I'd like to know if I spoke to them and they're, you know, why would I do that? When, when was the time that you changed your mind? When did abortion become okay? What's wrong with these people, Jim Hansen? They, they've never really wanted to win. They wanted to have the appearance of holding the right ideas and, and somehow being on the moral high ground. The problem was they weren't on the moral high ground because they didn't actually have the strength of their own beliefs, as you pointed out. And Trump is the great clarifier. And I think we were we were in a great tribalization right now where, you know, we're picking our tribes. Are you a member of the Liberty and Personal Responsibility tribe or are you the free love and no consequences tribe? I you think we're I we think, are. I think you and I, Jim Hansen, are part of the consequences tribe. I think you listeners to the Hugh Hewitt radio program are part of the consequences tribe. I want you to stick around. We got David Drucker of the Washington Examiner coming up and a lot more. We are back on the Hugh Hewitt radio program. I'm guest host Kurt Schlichter, senior columnist at townhall.com, trial lawyer, retired colonel, author of the new book, We'll Be Back, The Fall and Rise of America. You can see it behind me if you're watching on the universe. That sinister music means only one thing. We are joined by David Drucker, Washington Examiner senior reporter, one of my favorite guests. Follow him at David M. Drucker on the Twitter machine. David, how are you doing this morning? Anything hey, in Kurt. the news? Oh, you know, not much. Yeah. Tuesday. So I'm, I'm wondering, I, I, I'm sure you've been closely watching the very important J6 uh, uh, committee meetings. Are you going to be uh, uh, also following the uh, uh, Hunter Biden committee hearings once the republicans take over in january yeah sure i will i mean look it's my job to follow these hearings uh whichever they are whoever's running them and see what comes from them well of course david drucker the uh the the premise of that last question was that there will be hearings and there are a lot more revelations about the relationship between uh joe biden and his uh coke snorting snipper uh, stripper felix uh, foreigner-owned uh, son. Uh, do, do you think that's going to become an issue in the 2024 campaign? Because apparently Joe Biden's running. Well, it could, and it sort of depends on, you know, what what these hearings would uncover and how voters would feel about them as a, you know, sort of, you know, voters make these complex choices about about individual candidates then individual candidates based on who they're running against, then individual candidates based on who they're running against and what's going on in their own life and political atmospherics and what's going on in the world. So this, look, this could very well be problematic uh, for Joe Biden in a 2024 campaign, but it depends on, on what's uncovered, uh, how the public reacts, and also how the hearing is conducted. I mean, I have to say, Kurt, um, for instance, you know, I always felt in watching the, the Benghazi Select Committee that there was a lot to investigate and a lot of information to uncover. And who knows how we might have felt about whatever was uncovered. I, I in retrospect, or even as, wa as I watched it, never thought the committee did a very good job of just uncovering information that we could then digest. And, whereas I feel like this January 6th committee, whatever you think of the information that is being uncovered, I feel like the committee is doing a much better job than the Benghazi Select Committee of focusing on the information. Again, you can choose to feel how you want about it, but of focusing on the information, uncovering information, and allowing people, to, you know, allowing that to be the center of attention. So a committee properly run 
has a better chance of bringing to light information that voters can then make decisions on. And so a lot will go into this. Mm, Well, David Drucker, my opinion of the J6 committee is it has less dignity and long-term impact than uh, a Jeffrey Tube and phone uh, Zoom call. Uh, Look, Kamala Harris is... (laughs) Kamala Harris has announced uh, that she is going to be Joe Biden's running mate in 2024. Uh, Does that surprise you at all? No. I mean, what do you expect her to say? Well, I I, I say that a little. I I, I understand what she's saying. But, you know, do Democrats really want to run on a guy who's manifestly senile and this nimrod? I mean, really, to going up against even even against Donald Trump, who um, you know is the you know has a, uh, a a lot of people who dislike him, uh, or against a Ron DeSantis or some other uh, new one, John, Tom Cotton, Mike Pompeo, or something. I, I just think the Democrats have got to be sweating out twenty twenty four right now. Well, you know, when you're staring down the barrel of a midterm wave that's going to go against you, you're always sweating it out. But I think that number one. Um, how Joe Biden looks to voters and how he governs with a Republican majority could look a lot different uh, than how things look right now. We've seen presidents get shellacked in midterm elections and come back and win re-election. Um, so this happens all the time. Secondly, I think the Democratic bench is pretty thin. Um, look, they just you know, Joe Biden has his flaws. That's undeniable. But when you look at the ability to win key swing states, Find me another Democrat right now that has as much opportunity, uh, a much ability, much political appeal to win in these key swing states as he does. And I don't think that list is big. Now, candidates can emerge. He has his flaws. But, you know, one of the reasons why it's not as simple as Joe Biden simply declaring he won't run and look at all these young, fresh faces who can win Georgia and Arizona. Tell me who they are. And I think that if you look at a Republican bench, for instance, there is a much deeper bench of candidates we could posit that with all of their flaws, because they always have them, all candidates do, have better opportunities to put together 270 electoral votes. And I think that's part of the dilemma the Democrats have to work through. Well, we have about 15 seconds, David Drucker, uh, senior reporter at the Washington Examiner. Uh We've had, uh, you know, three days of uh, momentous court decisions uh, issuing from the Supreme Court, including Dobbs. What do you think the effect of those are going to be on the midterm? In 2022, minimal, minimal, as far as I can tell right now. In 2024, it could be a whole different story. Interesting. Interesting perspective from David Drucker, the Washington Examiner, where he's senior reporter. Follow him at David M. Drucker and stick around here. On the Hugh Hewitt Radio Program, I'm guest host Kurt Schlichter. Follow me on Twitter at Kurt Schlichter, spelled just like it sounds. Uh, New York City Young Republicans on July, I believe, 27th, in support of my new book, We'll Be Back, The Fall and Rise of America. It talks about all the challenges that face America. National divorce, civil war, the rise of barren white Chardonnay swilling liberal women. So all the all the threats to America and how we can defeat them. So uh, come on out to the New York City Young Republicans on uh, I believe it's July 27th in New York City. I'm going to sneak in. Uh, I'm going to use Dwayne's ID to get in because because I'm on a list, a list of patriots. We are now joined by one of my favorite guests when I guest host here on the Hugh Hewitt radio program. He is the Washington Examiner's chief political consultant, cons- oh, excuse me, correspondent, Byron York. Yeah, I, I'd like to consult with you, Byron. Can I you consult with you? I'm going to raise my rates if I'm a consultant. Maybe well, I look, I, uh, as a uh, noted Los Angeles trial lawyer, billable hours are my lifeblood. So I can give you some <laughs> hints on that. For instance, you should be billing this entire appearance plus preparation. So. I am. I am. Hours and hours and hours. I, I, you know, it's, I, it's, I, I think it's at least a 6.7. It's funny. You're talking about New York. I was just reading in the New York Times that New York City's non-citizen voting law has been struck down. And, you know, New York City had a law. You can actually, yes. not, non-citizens can vote in municipal elections. And the interesting thing is, um, there's a, a judge in Staten Island 
um, who who said that it was unconstitutional. So they're all upset. They're all enraged about this. Well, it's unconstitutional, because, I believe, under New York uh, state law. Well, you know, the interesting thing is, uh, I'm going to read to the New York Times, proponents of non-citizen voting have worked for decades to secure the measure, and they vowed to appeal. They argue that although the state constitution stipulates that citizens can vote, it does not explicitly exclude non-citizens from voting. Well, So I, I went to the Constitution <laughs> of New York, uh, and there it is, Section 1, every citizen shall be entitled to vote at every election for all officers, etc. And huh. that is the clause that the uh, left in New York claims uh, legalizes non-citizen voting. It's absolutely bizarre. Well, that's an idiosyncratic reading of the statute, which seems pretty clear to me and to the judge. Um, but, yeah, you know, we, we've had some idiosyncratic readings of uh, constitutions uh, of late, uh, mostly in dissent. Uh, Thursday, we had New York State Rifle Pistol Association reaffirming the Second Amendment. Of course, Dobbs sending abortion back to the states on Friday. And then just yesterday, we had Kennedy, which says, yeah, you, you, you've got a right to pray even if you are a public employee. How do you think these conservative opinions, uh, which were subject to rather legal argument free dissents, uh, are going to affect the uh, 2022 midterms and the 2024 election? Yeah, well, uh, my my favorite qu uh, quote about the uh, the football field praying was, you know, the the coach prayed on the fifty yard line, and Mary Catherine Ham said, Judge Justice Roberts issued a concurrence saying it should be the thirty yard line. See, that's um, funny. That's actually, comedy that was gold. A good joke, actually, there that's, you go. that's comedy gold. Um, well, oh, well, as far as the as far as the Dobbs the the road decision is concerned. Um, this is something we just have to wait and see how it works out. Obviously, these states that had passed laws restricting abortion, if Roe were shut down, th those are states with a majority of people in favor of, of that. Um, and nobody has been talking about the states, and they're the states in which most abortions are performed, uh, in which nothing changes, or perhaps the abortion laws become even more liberal. You know, if you if you look at the states uh, that have the most liberal abortion laws, it looks just like the electoral map. You've got California, Washington State, oh, yes. Oregon on the on the west I, coast. I think my home Illinois. state. I, I think my home state of California has actually made it mandatory. Exactly. <laughs> yeah, Illinois in the middle. Then you have New York, New Jersey, and New England um, uh, on the east coast, and so. The question is, Is uh, are these abortion views already kind of baked in the cake of, of representatives, and are they not going to make this a huge difference? Um, the other thing is, uh, you know, an, an enormous number, at least half the abortions in the country are, are performed with medication. That is, they're, they're, they're brought about by taking a couple of pills, not, not a surgical procedure. And um, there's going to be huge legal fights about how to legalize that or, or, or not legalize that. Um, and we don't know exactly how they're going to, uh, going to uh, uh, play out. And the fact is, inflation hasn't gone away uh, every single day. You know, most people don't get abortions. Most people do have to buy food. So that's, I, I think that that remains by far the biggest single um, factor. Well, Byron York, um, chief political correspondent at the Washington Examiner, uh, one of the one of the issues with uh, something like Dobbs is, you know, the, the, the framing by the left has been, you know, abortion's been banned. And as you pointed out, which has been sent back to the states, my thought is, I don't think there's that much to fight about except at the margins. Here in California, I, I, I'll tell you, there's just there's just not going to be a battle of abortion. It's done. It's baked no. in the cake. It's in our Constitution already in the state. Uh, I don't have to like it, but that's the way it is. Uh, and I think for most states, 
that's what we'll see. I, I, I think there may be some litigation and maybe maybe even some statutes about sending abortion medications uh, through the post office or across state lines. But I, I, I really think this may have the chance of taking, uh, you know, kind of completely taking the wind ass sails of the pro-life and pro-choice movements. Uh, I mean, are we looking at a future where what ha- have been ma- uh, a, a major battleground culturally for 50 years suddenly becoming not much of a battleground at all? Where I mean, what issue will people move to? Well, it becomes fragmented, at least, if, yeah. if it remains with uh, the states. And, you know, I think we got a hint of where the blue states are going last September, uh, remember, obviously, obviously uh, a lot of people had expected the Supreme Court to do this for quite a while. Well, and after the leak, September, yeah. <laughs> well, that too. But it, uh, even last September, the House of Representatives passed a national legal uh, abortion bill. And you kind of get uh, a, a look at what their ideal abortion regime would be. And basically, what, what it did was it not only codified Roe, um, but it it would strike down all of the restrictions on abortion that had been passed in recent years, like uh, parental uh, notification and things like that. So it's it's that's what you've got in California, and that's what you're going to get, I think, in all of the bluest states. And I, I was reading this morning. I think 68 percent of abortions last year were performed in uh, in states that Joe Biden won, the, the bluest of the blue states. Uh, so the, the one thing we're just not hearing in this hysterical coverage is, uh, for the majority of people who get abortions, nothing is going to change. Well, I, I think people are going to find out uh, or, or figure that out pretty quickly, because now we have a lot of misinformation. Uh, you know, the mainstream media has hardly been uh, a, a paragon of clarity and honesty about reporting this. I mean, the, the honest thing is, okay, just a little hysterical, just just a bit. I, I do think it is interesting that the uh, uh, mainstream media and the uh, Democrat Party have uh, uh, once again learned what women are, which I think is uh, fascinating. Isn't that interesting? It is wow. remarkable. The, the, yeah. the thing is, though, what do you think that the change of the framing from safe, legal and rare, which I think was a brilliant framing? um to shout your abortion and you know people like uh stacy abrams unable to say no you can't have an abortion when the kid's eight months two weeks old you just can't do that that's that's infanticide that's crazy talk and democrats can't even say that uh we got about 10 seconds do you think that's going to hurt them help them or do nothing i i think it is not going to be a huge factor in 2022 nowhere near the way inflation is Thank you, Byron York, Washington Examiner, Chief Political Correspondent. This is guest host Kurt Schlichter on the Hugh Hewitt Radio Program. We're back on the Hugh Hewitt Radio Program. I am guest host Kurt Schlichter, senior columnist at townhall.com, noted trial lawyer in Los Angeles, retired Army colonel, author of the new book, We'll Be Back, The Fall and Rise of America. And I am joined by America's number one Madonna superfan, Jim Garrity of National Review and The Morning Jolt. Hi, Jim. How you doing? Kurt, yes, Madonna, not the one who's singing, the other one. <laughs> I, yeah, you know the the problem is about ninety percent of people today go, what other one? And that includes yeah, Catholics. Yeah. The, the other great irony, of course, is that you know here we we reached the day where Madonna seems stayed and buttoned down and calm. I realize she's now looks like a wax figure with all of her plastic surgeries and stuff like that. Yeah, she's but almost can, Biden-esque. Yeah. You can tell the kids today think that Madonna is kind of, you know, stodgy. I know. It's like, my grandma likes her. Classical music. Yes, exactly. Oh, jeez. Uh, well, Jim, Madonna and, and, and Papa Don't Preach come from, comes from a different time. It's a song about a, a girl who gets knocked up, and she says, I'm not going to have an abortion. I'm going to have the baby, and you know, works it out with her family. That harkens back to the safe, legal, and rare era of Bill Clinton, who I think was one of the great political minds. I mean, you, you, I got problems with Bill Clinton's policy, but if you deny he was a great politician, you are crazy. And I think the most, uh, the, the smartest formulation for the pro-choice people was safe, legal, and rare. That has morphed into bizarre twerking, pierced and tatted up 
uh, human freak show people shouting their abortions. I was going to say, shout your abortion. I, I, I it's insane. Over the past couple of days, how much we ended up at this point, in part because of the choices of the, for lack of a better term, pro-choice movement. But really, they really did morph into a pro-abortion movement. No, they have. And, and they they, they think, think it is a good thing. It's not a regrettable and unfortunate uh, but uh, uh, necessary procedure. Now it's liberating. And I think normal people look at that and go, you people are insane. Yeah. And I kind of wonder if you look back to the 1990s, it was the pro-life movement starting to run out of steam or, or was America, was it starting to build towards that consensus? And oh, by the way, you know, it's worth noting even before this decision, <clears throat> particularly since the 1990s, year by year, the abortion rate was coming down. Uh, now, you can chalk that up to, uh, you know, better use of birth control. You can do, chalk that up to a, you know, reduced birth rate. <clears throat> but you, I think, undisputably, I also think one of the factors was sonograms and people seeing the child and all of a sudden saying, okay, I cannot terminate this. This is not just some clump of cells. I see a heartbeat. I see eyes. Yep. I see a head. <clears throat> you know, um, you're a dad. I'm a dad. You know, when you, most of us walk around with that image of that sonogram. Uh, and, and keep it for, for the rest of our lives, the first time we see our child, right? So we don't say, oh, look, this, 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 look at this lovely picture of my child is just a clump of cells. You know, obviously, there's this intense emotional connection to it and gets people to see it as a human life. So I, my sense was that the pro-life movement was winning through a cultural change, less than a legal change before this came along. And then I, I suspect there were probably some pro-choicers, or pre I guess we said effectively pro-abortion, who were uncomfortable with that, who were uncomfortable with this natural decline in the abortion rate, and who said, no, 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 this is, if, if this rate, someday it'll become rarer and rarer, and maybe it'll become, you know, people will decide to ban it. Therefore, we need to dispute that it is something regrettable. We have to dispute that it is something people are uncomfortable with. Although, Kurt, I noticed, I was listening to somebody on CNN the other day, they kept using the term health care. Uh, yes. They, they keep using every euphemism. Other, they, it's like they, they completely want to preserve abortion, but they don't even want to use the word. Well, well the, 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 the more sensible ones don't. The, uh, uh, the real nuts embrace it completely. I want to kill the baby inside me. And I, it, it, it strikes me as, and I write about this abortion fetish, in my uh, town hall column on Thursday, it strikes me as, you know, the sophomore girl from the suburbs of Connecticut goes off to Wellesley. Then she comes back at Thanksgiving to freak out the squares, you know, because now she's got blue hair and a bolt through her nose. And she's like, you know, I'm in an experimental phase. You know, take that, daddy. Take that, mommy. It, it, it seems like they're living out personal psychodramas and normal people, I think, will look at that and just go, this is I didn't sign up for this. And it's been intriguing to see the like that safe, legal, and rare um, formulation that Bill Clinton put out. Like that rare, I was thought it was brilliant. That 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 rare was because like really because you know Democrat you know safe and legal you know you know pro lifers don't like that, but but the rare was the the olive branch. The rare was it, the it, it, it yeah. recognized people's natural reticence. Look, I. I you know, I guess early on in my life when I was younger, I was pro-choice, mostly because I didn't want to think about it. I just found the whole thing distasteful. I didn't have a real strong opinion. Uh, so I guess I just came in and I, I guess it's, you know, OK, until I really thought about it. But it, I, I didn't think about it because the whole thing was distasteful to me. I didn't hey, want yeah. anything to do with it. I think most normal people are like, ah. It was interesting for much of, you know, Kurt, you and I are roughly around the same age. And for much of our adult 38. Life, 30, okay. Uh, okay. Yeah. Uh, we're in that, that most of the debate around abortion was around these fringes, right? The yes. partial birth abortion, uh, parental notification for minors. Um, you know, the, the circumstances, you know, we, you know the, the objection to sex selective abortion, right? And the, the yeah. idea that, like, you know, well, we can understand, you know, rape, obviously, there are a lot of people who, a lot of pro lifers who are comfortable. With the idea of expecting a rape victim. Yes, and I, I, I think we'll see that in many of the red states. We'll have that exception. Uh, if you were doctrinaire pro-life, you you wouldn't have that yeah. exception. But I um, think people are going to make compromises. Yeah, there are pro-lifers who are, are you know vehemently opposed to in vitro fertilization. They don't like the idea of fertilizing a whole bunch of eggs and then keeping it in a freezer somewhere. You know, I think the, you know, this, there's less of a cultural consensus about this, but things like partial, partial birth abortion did have a cultural consensus. And the first argument is, well, it never happens. Or it does happen, it's only, in, you know, it's absolutely necessary to save the life of the mother. And you talk to doctors, like, actually, no, it's never necessary to save, you know, 
that particular procedure is never necessary to save the life, save the life of a mother. And the fact that the pro-choice movement or pro, you know, the pro-abortion movement couldn't give that ground, I think, is one of the factors that led us to this point today. I, I really feel like because there was room for a cultural compromise. Because people say, well, you know, Europe doesn't have these fights. Yes, and Europe generally bans it after 14 weeks. Well, I, I, th- I think we're going to get these compromises because now we have to actually deal with it politically. There's no you, you can't just say, well, the Supreme Court said you have to. And maybe there'll be a lawsuit later about it. Now people have to do it. And I look at a guy like uh, Glenn Youngkin. He's going to put in and uh, Ron DeSantis. They're going to stick in a 15 week and then they're going to be done. Yeah, I, I think uh, it would not shock me if you saw some states pass sweeping you know, bans and then live with the consequences. And, you know, two years, four years, six years down the road, say, you know what? This did not work out the way we wanted to. We did see people. Uh, you know, attempting to do illegal abortions and things like that. And it's possible they may rescind. I don't think we, who, those of us who like to see no abortions in America, have to recognize this is just one step in a very long journey. In fact, yesterday's Joel was about how I don't, you know, apparently somebody ran the numbers and suggested this will take down about, you know, 100,000 abortions a year, which is like, oh my goodness, that's great. But there are about 628,000 in a typical year. So well, that, it's tough to get the numbers. You look, know, the so political so. fight's going to move to the states. But the real fight is the, the, the culture, the human heart. Yeah. It, it, abortion's not going to be uh, minimized until the majority of Americans decide we're just not going to do this anymore because we don't want to. Yeah. And that's that that's is, the know. fight. We've got to convince people. And that's the beauty of the Dobbs decision. It, 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 it's not, you know, it, yeah, you pro-lifers, you've, you've won. No, no, no. Our, our work our work's still there. It's just changed. Mm-hmm. And also, it'll get Americans to start paying attention to their state governments. Yes. Which is really important and much more important than this. You know, this is a little askew, but just observing the sheer number of reporters who are in state houses and who cover what actually happens in state legislatures has dramatically declined mm-hmm. over the last 10 to 15 years. Yes, and because— that's a bad trend. Left, right, or center, that's a terrible trend because you want to know what your state government is doing. Well, look, I mean, if you look look on your uh, uh, local TV, do you see much coverage of your local yeah. events? I guess, I guess you do in northern Virginia uh, lately. No, no, I, I, you know, we, coverage of the state government is only like—I feel like three or four stories a year are big. It's also a relatively short, you know, legislative session. But yeah, you don't get a ton of this. And I, you know, hear almost nothing about what goes on in Maryland, even though it's just across the river. And, you know, local government is not seen as a big, consequential, exciting story. And yeah, what happens there can be extremely consequential for your lives. Well, that's certainly true. Now, speaking of consequential, what do you think the effect of uh, the Dobbs decision, maybe even New York uh, Rifle Pistol Association, and uh, uh, the decision yesterday, Kennedy and uh, praying on the football field. What do you think these decisions, this conservative movement of the court, uh, is going to have on 2022? Because it looks to me like there's a red wave coming. Will this mitigate it or even help it? So, Kurt, the first thing is I'm giving your, the listeners of the Hugh Hewitt program a preview of the morning jolt before I send it off to the editors. Excellent. There, there is a poll out conducted by the Boston Globe and Suffolk University up in Rhode Island. Second oh, well, I trust it. All right. Well, no, no, listen, because here's the thing, is that Rhode Island has not had a Republican elected to the House of Representatives, U.S. House of Representatives, since 1992. Right now, Alan Well, Fong, that was Lincoln Chafee, right? No, no. So, you know, Lincoln Chafee was in the Senate. Okay. And, you know, so John Chafee was there before that. But, you know, it's been a long, long time. So in the second district right now, Alan Fung, the Republican, or at least the Republican who's leading the Republican primary out there, is ahead of the Democrat who leads the primary out there, 45% to 39%. Are you kidding me? This I'm is Rhode Island. So, this is not a huge lead. You know, things could still change. But this is a district, again, has not had a Democrat in, you know, since, you, since I was in high school. Holy and cow. Right now, Republican leads. Okay. That's the kind of wave we're looking at right now. Well, look, yeah. we've got uh, about 15 seconds, Jim yeah. Garrity, National Review Online. Go sign up for his morning jolt. Um Jim, what is the over and under for the House of Representatives and the Senate for Republicans in 2022? I'm going to put it at about 30, which might seem disappointing, but a lot of this is because of the fact that there's a low floor, the high floor, because Dem- Republicans are already close to you know a handful of seats within the majority. How about the Senate? Uh, Republicans gained two, I think, but that, that could change. I think Republicans uh, three and a half. Uh, this is uh, Jim Garrity. 
from National Review Online. He does the morning jolt. I am Kurt Schlichter, guest hosting for the great Hugh Hewitt. Stick around. We got Ilya Shapiro coming up. We're back on the Hugh Hewitt radio program with guest host Kurt Schlichter, senior columnist at townhall.com. Noted Los Angeles trial lawyer. My next guest is Director of Constitutional Studies at the Manhattan Institute, Ilya Shapiro. Ilya, how are you doing? Good to be on. I got the reference with your music. Nice choice. You like that? Well, let's not spread the word to Barzini about where you're, uh, where you're on the lamb. Um, <laughs> Ilya, uh, uh, first of all, everybody in the Hugh Hewitt radio program is very uh, uh, just outraged about what happened at Georgetown, and I don't want to follow. I, I, I don't want to dig deeply in that because I think you're trying to put it behind you. Uh, are you doing okay? I'm doing great, and and uh, to to form to fill in your listeners about that uh, oblique exchange we just had. I'm in Sicily on vacation <laughs> with my family, but I. I, I respect you so much, and you're all right as well, Kurt. So I figured that I'd, I'd make an exception to my no work, no media rule uh, uh, to do this. Uh, and um, if, if people really do want to support what I'm trying to do with this this moment, this platform I've been given regarding cancel culture and academia and the rot they're in, uh, I just started a Substack, uh, Shapiro's Gavel. So go check that out. I just had like a couple of posts before leaving on vacation. But that's where I'll be doing a lot of uh, the commentary relevant to that. Well, outstanding, everybody. Uh, Ilya Shapiro has made you all an offer you can't refuse. So take him up on his <laughs> substack, the Ilya Shapiro gavel. Let's get right into it. Uh, there's a lot going on in the world of constitutional law. Three momentous decisions in three days. And the reporting that I look, I'm a trial lawyer. I went to con, I did con law 30 years ago. I passed the bar. Uh, I, I think I get what's going on pretty well. But the takes I've seen, Ilya, have been uh, remarkably dumb. What? Uh, how can we teach American citizens what the Supreme Court's supposed to do and how it does it? Because uh, people don't they think abortion has been banned. Uh, by Dobbs, right. where in reality, abortion has simply been returned to the states where we all get a say in how we're going to handle it state by state. Yeah, I, I have a piece coming out in the Washington Examiner, I think later today, the way the time zones work, uh, based on a tweet thread that I recently had, trying to say how, how disingenuous all of these takes are, as, as you said, uh, that you know the Supreme Court is political and it's partisan and it's Republican and it's just ideological and it's not deciding on the law. Well, you know how is it if the if the six in the majority are that way or the three in the dissent not that way? Is if everyone is political all the way down? No, I do not question the good faith or uh, you know uh, uh, of any of the justices. I, I think they're all applying the law as they see it. The problem is in many areas of constitutional law and certainly these big four cases. That have come down in the last seven days: school choice, yep. abortion, guns, and uh, and prayer at schools. Um, uh, it's just different visions of how to apply and interpret the Constitution. And the thing is, a lot of the critics of the Supreme Court simply do not take originalism and textualism and other methods based on the history and structure of the Constitution seriously. Either they're projecting because, especially journalists, they think it's just you know applying your values or what have you or they're just being disingenuous and not honest academics. Um, and and that's, the, that's the real problem, because what the court is doing, it, it didn't, as you said, it didn't ban abortion. It didn't say all guns are okay. You have to read the actual specifications of what they're doing. And they're saying if a, a, the Second Amendment is in the Constitution, keep and bear arms includes the right to bear arms. Now, what regulatory schemes, licensing, whatever, they said, you know, most are okay, but you can't leave it, leave it to an arbitrary decision by an official. With abortion, the Constitution's silent. And I, as a lawyer, Kurt, I've never been public with what I think about abortion policy, but as a matter of law, uh, as a lawyer, I can't tell you the, the, the answer of when, right, when life begins or where rights uh, attach to that human being. You know, three weeks, 10 weeks, 15, birth, quickening, installment, whatever you want to talk about, that's not a legal answer. That's a political, theological, uh, philosophical, uh, uh, fundamentally political uh, answer. So the court is being very careful. It's just what you're seeing is divisions in uh, basic approaches to the Constitution and the judge's role. doesn't mean you can't disagree, disagree vehemently, absolutely. Uh, but none of the justices are acting in bad faith or as anything other than lawyers and judges. Well, Ilya Shapiro of the Manhattan Institute's uh, uh, Directorate of uh, Constitutional Studies, 
I've got a bone to pick with uh, uh, the uh, liberal bloc because I'm looking at the dissent, particularly in Dobbs, but also uh, I, I think most prominently in New York State Rifle Pistol Association. I didn't see a lot of legal analysis. I saw a lot of table pounding. Um, you know, they they did. You know, uh, if you look at Dobbs, I don't think they effectively set out where they find this right to abortion. And by having emotionally charged dissents rather than ones based on, uh, you know, dry, boring constitutional analysis, uh, I, I think they do a great disservice. We have about 15 seconds. Uh, why don't yeah, no, they? I, I, I agree with that. Kurt, I agree with that. And, uh, you know, in Dobbs, they basically relied on side to side. It's an old precedent. Yep. How dare you overturn an old precedent? Well, you know, well, Brown versus Board of Education would like a moment to talk about overturning it, precedent. Exactly. Exactly. Ilya Shapiro, enjoy your time in Sicily. Have a little pasta and uh, red wine for me. I'm Kurt Schlichter. This is the Hugh Hewitt Radio Program. We're going to be right back with Carrie Severino. So, We've been talking a lot about the Supreme Court, and we're going to continue that with an expert, someone who is actually a clerk on the court, I believe, Kerry Severino, president of the Judicial Crisis Network. Kerry, welcome to the Hugh Hewitt Radio Program. Oh, it's great to be here. Well, Kerry, let me ask you something. Uh, look, I'm a trial lawyer. Uh, I believe you're an appellate lawyer. What do you think the first thing I do when I get a new case is? Uh, look at the vote lineup or read the summary. What's your, uh, <laughs> what's your idea? Uh, well, when I get a new ca- when I get a new case to fight, the first thing I do is I look up ah. the judge and who appointed him, her, or them exactly. if they're uh, you know non-binary or some other bizarre pseudo gender. Uh, the, the point I'm trying to make is there's been a lot of talk about the politicization of the court, but as a practical matter, often you can figure out how a judge is likely to go in a political case. Now, in a business case, for instance. You know, one of the best arguments I ever had was in front of a, a Ninth Circuit judge who was appointed by Obama, very, very liberal, asked great questions and uh, uh, seemed to have good analysis. But when it comes to political cases, we can often figure out how they're going to vote. Do you think that that is a reality, especially if you look at the lineup on the uh, uh, the dissents and the uh, uh, main opinions uh, of the last week? What, a, what effect do you think that has on the public perception of the courts? Uh, well, you know, I, I wish that weren't the case. I wish we had uh, two parties that were interested in appointing judges who were faithful to the Constitution and the rule of law, uh, because that's uh, that's really what a judge is supposed to do. They're not supposed to be inserting their own policy into it. They just are supposed to do what the law itself says. And that can mean liberal results, and that can mean conservative results. But what we've seen is that uh, unfortunately, the Democrats have really wedded themselves to the idea of that judges are supposed to be also coming up with policy results. You can kind of see that in some of the cases that came down uh, this past week. You look at the dissents and you got a dissent in the gun case where three Democrat appointees just went on and on about their concerns about gun safety. Not about the Constitution, what? but their concerns about guns. And the same thing in the abortion case. Like if, if you're not talking about the, the actual law here, and you're talking instead about how you think the policy should go, that's a signal you're not acting like a judge. And unfortunately... Uh, I, well, I think most Americans actually want their judges to act like judges. I think, unfortunately, we have a lot of politicians uh, who'd rather appoint people that are going to use the court to achieve their, their own policy end. Well, Carrie Severino of the Judicial Crisis Network, congratulations. You took my follow-up question because I was going to point to those dissents. <laughs> and and, and the, the, the significant thing I found about them was the total dearth of legal analysis I, 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 I was going to say, uh, the, the argument in Dobbs is there is no, constitu- at the base of it, there is no constitutional right to abortion. There's nothing expressed in the Constitution, no historical precedent uh, creating a right of long standing, for instance, like marriage would be, right? Mm-hmm. Uh, that doesn't necessarily have to be mentioned, but we all understand it uh, to be a right. They never grappled with that argument at all. They simply said, well, we've been wrong for so long. You shouldn't undo it. I, I I find that troubling because that does politicize the court. Oh yeah, and, and they went even. They were kind of. It's kind of like two halves to it. One is, well, this is so important; it must be in there. 
Well, no, no. It, it, is it in there or isn't it? I mean, look at the words. It's not, this is a really important thing, so it must be constitutional. But then you're right. It's like, even if it's wrong, we should do it because it's also a really important thing. Mm, and it, because it's been around for a long time. Mm. You know, those same judges, when they, just go back one day earlier in, in the gun case. They spent yep. their whole dissent basically taking issue with the previous holding of the Supreme Court. You know, the court has already talked about whether there's an individual right to bear arms and said there is. You still got three justices who are like, yeah, I don't buy that. And yet they lecture the conservative justices on stare decisis and on following precedent if if they want to overturn something that's just not even in the Constitution. So it's like, wait a minute, guys, you can't just it, it, it just turn it into a political thing that they throw at cases that they like, that they say, oh, you have to hold, uphold our cases. But then when it comes to the cases that they might disagree with and the precedents they disagree with, they're happy to throw them out. Um, and, and, you know, I have to say, I, I think that's the right answer is if you, if you think a case is really constitutionally wrong, throw it out. But please don't lecture me and pretend that all of your cases are sacrosanct um, because, because they've been decided. And so we have to just leave them where they are in, in perpetuity. Well, Carrie Severino, uh, one of the things that struck me about the dissent in the gun case, New York State Pistol Rifle Pistol Association versus Bruin, was the, first of all, the dissent, you know, the, the the listing of all these tragedies was not particularly effective because, as Samuel Alito pointed out, well, you got one that's a guy who shot up a place in Buffalo, the same state where these laws that you think are so necessary to prevent these things are actually in effect. So, you know, a, as an argument, it, it, it just invites the counter argument. But they've evidently discovered a right that isn't much of a right, because is it really a right if the legislature can overturn it just because essentially it thinks it's a good idea? Uh, yeah, no, it, it, it is the the decision in that case. Again, they're 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 very concerned about these policy issues. All the stuff they said are valid things to if you want to bring up at a legislative hearing. If you if you know if they want to say, hey, here's the here's the types of gun violence we're concerned about. Here are the things we think are going to help that, you know, then you can have a debate about whether it really would help. Um, and that's where, and that's where the, you know, well, the, 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 the first step of course would be whether, whether they actually could do any of those things, because as uh, justice Thomas pointed out, we're not going through intermediate scrutiny or strict scrutiny because those are in essence, balancing tests. The, the mere fact that it is an amendment eliminates any balancing test. The balance has been done. We're going to go with keep and bear arms. So was that restriction understood to exist at the time these second amendment was, uh, uh, was ratified and, the the ju uh, the justices in dissent don't like that. They want to go back and decide case by case whether they whether that the right is important enough, which raises a question: What do the liberal justices think a right is? Exactly. Well, what 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 they love, I think, about these balancing tests. I think you know, if the average person doesn't doesn't know what these are, it's sort of these tests of like, well. It went, you're, you're violating a right that's protected in the Constitution, but instead of just saying, wow, did that violate a right? You say, well, is it burdening, you know, is it burdening your expression? And if so, is it a good enough reason to burden it? And so it, it creates a huge amount of territory that judges can kind of balance. Their, sometimes they give all these factors, and you're balancing four different factors. Basically, anyone can balance them in whatever different, you know, well, weight, giving weight to whatever, to come up with the result they want. It gives power to judges, and they'd rather have the final call. Well, as everything. as Judge Van Dyke in the Ninth Circuit pointed out, the Ninth Circuit had 50 or 51 cases with gun restrictions. And in all of them, every single one of them, the court found, well, yeah, this uh, this restriction is justified. It's not much of a right, in my view, if 100 percent of the time, anytime the legislature wants to limit that right, it can. It becomes something else. But I, again, what do liberal judges or liberal jurists think a right actually is? It, do they ever tell us? Uh, no, except for when you're I mean, I think they, I think what you get the idea of a right is is when when they find something that they really like like abortion and then it's like under under no circumstances so maybe they have a sense because if, if, if you if you tried to get in the way of any you know abortion kind of thing they'll say whoa 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 and, and justice thomas had a great 
dissent a, a few years ago, and I think it had to do with a, a, a ten day waiting period to buy a gun. It was something like that. And he goes, you know, I'm not I'm not coming to a conclusion about whether this is or isn't valid yet. But let's just the court didn't even take the case, and he said. Just imagine you had a 10-day waiting period to get an abortion. You would take that case tomorrow. You'd be like, oh, my gosh, this is potentially really serious. And some right, for some reason, you know, mem- some members of the court don't really think me- merit that level. Well, some so rights are more equal. Get it, but only for their favorite right. <laughs> some rights are more equal than others. Carrie Severino, right. exactly. uh, president of Judicial Crisis Network. Thank you very much for sharing your expertise here. Uh, we are coming back on the Hugh Hewitt radio program. We have a